Welcome to A Cartoonist Guide to the Bible. I'm Steve Thomason, and if you are following the narrative lectionary, you know that we, for the next two weeks, are preaching from Acts chapter 15 and the first two chapters of Paul's letter to the Galatians. And so I put together a PowerPoint that uh, walks through, gives context for both of these two texts because they're so interwoven, gives the backstory of the Apostle Paul, and uh, reads through all of the texts. And so you can download this PowerPoint for free. Uh, there's also a, a zip file that has all of the slides as JPEG images, so you can put them in whatever presentation software works for you. Uh, you can use one slide. You can use all the slides. Use it in your preaching, your teaching, or just use it as your own personal study. Hey, this is a resource that has helped me study this text. I want to share it with you. So now I'm just going to walk you through all these slides, and uh, I hope you enjoy. Let's dive in. Welcome to a cartoonist guide to Acts 15 and Galatians 1 through 2. We begin with the story of Saul in Acts chapter 8, verse 1, which is the end of the story of Stephen, the brutal killing of Stephen in the streets. Acts, chap, uh, Acts chapter 8, verse 1 says, and Saul approved of their killing him. And then it goes on to say that uh, severe persecution broke out against the church that day, and Saul hunted the disciples down and dragged them to prison. It was a reign of terror from Saul. And we skip into chapters 8 through 9, talks about how this persecution scattered the church into Judea and Samaria. Peter and Philip do their work. Last week in the narrative lectionary, we looked at the story of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. And then we come to Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 30, which is the story of Saul's conversion. Saul was given permission to go to the northern city of Damascus, where he could arrest the followers of Jesus, put them in prison, and, and he was hoping that he could execute them and wipe out the scourge. On his way to Damascus, he encounters the risen Christ who says, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul responds. I am Jesus, whom you persecute. Get up and go to the city. I'll tell you what you are to do there. So Saul gets up. He is blind and he is led into the city of Damascus and he sits in Judas's house for three days. And there's a disciple of Jesus named Ananias. And the Lord comes to him and says, Ananias, here I am, Lord. Go to Straight Street, to Judah's house. Saul of Tarsus is there. He has seen that you are coming to heal his sight. But Lord, this man is evil. He has come to hurt us. Go, for he is a vessel that I have chosen to bring my name to the Gentiles. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. So Ananias goes to Judah's house. Brother Saul, Jesus sent me so you can see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And here we have two men, Ananias and Saul. Ananias used to fear Saul, and Saul used to hate Ananias, but now they can actually see each other. And Saul experiences the grace of Jesus Christ firsthand. Now in verse 20 it says, And immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. The next section of Acts talks about how most people are freaked out by this radical transformation of the one who was coming to kill them. And uh, he has to escape Damascus, and he goes to Jerusalem. And then in verse 28 it says, So he went in and out among them in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. He spoke and argued with the Hellenists, but they were attempting to kill him. Now, these are the same ones who killed Stephen, if you remember. Now, when the believers learned of it, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. Thus ends chapter 9. We have to skip to chapter 11, verse 25, before we pick up the story of Saul. It says, Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So it was that for an entire year... They met with the church and taught a great many people, and it was in Antioch that the disciples were first called Christians. Now, in the city of Antioch, it was this beautiful, multi-ethnic group of leaders, 
And these people came together and commissioned Paul. His name was then called Paul, his, his Greek name, and Barnabas to take the message of Jesus across the sea. And so from Acts chapters 13 through 14, we see them go to the island of Cyprus, and then they go up to the region of Pisidia, to the city of Antioch. Paul preaches in the synagogue there. They tell him to get out. He goes to Iconium. He has another confrontation. They threaten to stone him. He escapes. In Lystra, there are only Gentiles there. They think that they are that Paul and Barnabas are gods because of their healing power, but they're not. They're just the servants of the one true God. But then Paul's enemies chase him into Lystra. They stone him, leave him for dead. His friends drag him to Derby, where he recuperates. He retraces his step and comes back to Antioch. That's that's the story of Acts chapter thirteen through fourteen. Now we come to Acts chapter fifteen, which is what we're preaching on the first week of this two week. Uh, cycle. And so let's look at the actual story of the Jerusalem Council. It says, Then certain individuals came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers. Remember, they're still in Antioch, so this is all happening in Antioch. They're teaching the brothers, Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. In other words, they're saying, You have to first become a Jew. And follow Moses' law before you can follow Jesus. Verse 2. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to discuss this question with the apostles and the elders. So they were sent on their way by the church. And as they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, they reported the conversion of the Gentiles and brought great joy to all the believers. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all that God had done with them. But some believers who belonged to the sect of the Pharisees stood up. Now that's important because these are followers of Jesus as the Messiah who are uh, still practicing and identifying as Pharisees. So they stood up and said, it is necessary for them, the Gentiles, to be circumcised and ordered to keep the law of Moses. The apostles and the elders met together to consider this matter. After there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, My brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that I should be the one through whom the Gentiles would hear the message of the good news and become believers. He's most likely talking about his experience with Cornelius. In verse 8, and God, who knows the human heart, testified to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. And in cleansing their hearts by faith, he has made no distinction between them, the uncircumcised, and us, the circumcised. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing on the neck of the disciples a yoke that neither our ancestors nor we have been able to bear? On the contrary, we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. The whole assembly kept silence and listened to Barnabas and Paul as they told of all the signs and wonders that God had done through them among the Gentiles. This is the story of Acts 13 through 14, which is the first journey that we just looked at. Now, after they had finished speaking, James replied, My brothers, listen to me. Simeon has related how God first looked favorably on the Gentiles to take from among them a people for his name. This agrees with the words of the prophets as it is written. So now James reads a passage from Amos chapter 9, verse 11 and 12, which says, After this I will return. And I will rebuild the dwelling of David, which has fallen. From its ruins I will rebuild it, and I will set it up, so that all other peoples may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles, over whom my name has been called. Thus says the Lord, who has been making these things known from long ago. Therefore, I have reached the decision. 
that we should not trouble the, those Gentiles who are turning to God, but we should write to them to abstain only from things polluted by idols and from fornication and from whatever has been strangled and from blood. For in every city for generations past, Moses has had those who proclaim him, for he has been read aloud every Sabbath in the synagogues. Now we skip to verse 28, and this is the actual letter that they wrote to the church in Antioch. For it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to impose on you no further burden than these essentials, that you abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols and from blood and from what is strangled and from fornication. If you keep yourselves from these, you'll do well. Farewell. Then Paul goes up, Paul and Barnabas part ways, and Paul, this is where um, many scholars believe that Paul writes the letter to the Galatians just after this big decision. And now let's jump into Galatians. So in verses 1, chapter 1, 1 through 10, Paul is basically saying, you foolish Galatians, why are you turning away from the simple gospel and following a bunch of pointless rules? Let's dive into the text. In classic opening of epistles, the author, Paul an Apostle, a description of the author, sent neither by human commission nor from human authorities, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the members of God's family who are with me. Here's the recipient to the churches of Galatia. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to set us free from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, Instead of saying something nice and pleasant greetings, the very first thing Paul says is, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Pause. That's the basic message of this section. Paul taught them about Jesus, and now they are listening to a different message, and Paul's pretty upset. Now, verses 7 through 9 are, are a, a classic Paul side note rant. And he says, not that there is another gospel, but there are some who are confusing you and want you to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should proclaim to you a gospel contrary to what we proclaim to you, let that one be accursed. As we have said before, so now I repeat, if anyone proclaims to you a gospel contrary to what you received, let that one be accursed. <laughs> There's only one message of Jesus. Verse 10, am I now seeking human approval or God's approval? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still pleasing people, I would not be a servant of Christ. So whenever Paul says something like this, obviously somebody has accused him of just trying to make everybody happy. It's like, oh, you're just, you're just, you know, placating the Gentiles because you just, you're watering down the gospel, whatever. He's like, I don't think so. So let's look at Galatians 1, 11 through 24. For I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel that was proclaimed by me is not of human origin, for I did not receive it from a human source, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. Remember, Saul was encountered by the risen Christ, and he is claiming that he was actually taught the good news by Jesus directly. Verse 13, you have heard, no doubt, of my earlier life in Judaism. I was violently persecuting the church of God and was trying to destroy it. I advanced in Judaism beyond many among my people of the same age, for I was far more zealous for the traditions of my ancestors. Right? So from Saul's perspective, he is serving God by getting rid of these disciples of Jesus. Verse 15, But when God, who had set me apart before I was born and called me through his grace, was pleased to reveal his son to me so that I might proclaim him among the Gentiles, I did not confer with any human being, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were already apostles before me, but I went away once into Arabia, and afterwards I returned to Damascus. Then, verse 18, Then after three years I did go up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas and stayed with him fifteen days. But I did not see any other apostle except James, the Lord's brother. In what I am writing to you before God, I do not lie. 
Then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and I was still unknown by sight to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only heard it said, the one who formerly was persecuting us is now proclaiming the faith that he once tried to destroy, and they glorified God because of me. Now, as we go into this, remember, as Paul recounts this Jerusalem council, the book of Acts has not yet been written. So the, the Galatians are hearing about this for the first time. And so he says then in verse 2, Then, after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along with me. Now, Titus was a, a Greek man that he picked up along the way while he was in Galatia. I went up in response to a revelation. Then I laid before them, though only in a private meeting with the acknowledged leaders, the gospel that I proclaim among the Gentiles, in order to make sure that I was not running or had not run in vain. But even Titus, who was with me, was not compelled to be circumcised, though he was a Greek. But because of false believers secretly brought in, who slipped in to spy on the freedom we have in Christ Jesus, so that they might enslave us, we did not submit to them, even for a moment, so that the truth of the gospel might always remain with you. And from those who were supposed to be acknowledged leaders, what they actually were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Those leaders contributed nothing to me. On the contrary, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel for the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel for the circumcised, for he who worked with, through Peter, making him an apostle to the circumcised, also worked through me in sending me to the Gentiles. And when James and Cephas and John, who were acknowledged pillars, recognized the grace that had been given to me, they gave to Barnabas and me the right hand of fellowship agreeing that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. They asked only one thing, that we remember the poor, which was actually what I was eager to do. So all of that section, chapters 1, verses 11 through 2, chapter, uh, chapter 2, verse 10, is summarized like this. Hey, Galatians, Jesus taught me the gospel. I'm a legit apostle. You can trust me. So what are you doing? <laughs> Now, there's one more story from in verses 11 through 21 that's not found in the book of Acts. And so he tells them this story. But when Cephas came to Antioch, now this is Peter, I opposed him to his face because he stood self-condemned. For until certain people came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But after they came, he drew back and kept himself separate for fear of the circumcision faction. And the other Jews joined him in his, this hypocrisy, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not acting consistently with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, If you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? Ho, ho! So, that is... Paul's personal testimony. He's talking to the Galatians and he's saying, hey, I've, I gave you the gospel of Jesus and it had nothing to do with you being coming circumcised or following the laws of Moses because you are Gentiles. And so here's the deal. So now let's get into some theology. Here's his argument. He says, we ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners, right? So Paul is acknowledging, hey, I'm, I'm Jewish. I am of the circumcision. Verse 16, yet we know that a person is justified not by the works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. And we have come to believe in Christ Jesus so that we might be justified by faith in Christ Jesus and not by doing the works of the law, because no one will be justified by the works of the law. All right, this begs a whole bunch of questions. First of all, what does it mean to be justified. So the Greek word here is dikaiao, which is mostly and usually translated justified, justifies, justify. It is also translated vindicated, freed, acknowledged, set, acquitted. And the definition from Lo and Nita says that this word means the act of clearing someone of transgression, to acquit, to set free, to remove guilt, acquittal. In a number of languages, the process of acquittal takes the form of a direct statement. For example, 
to say you are not guilty or you no longer have sin or as expressed idiomatically in some instances, sin is no longer on your head or your sins are now given back to you. So we are justified. How are we justified? Not by the works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. And we have come to believe in Christ Jesus so that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by doing the works of the law because no one will be justified by the works of the law. Now, we got to define a couple of things. First of all, the works of the law refer to the circumcision and the dietary laws that, that show that you are a member of the nation of Israel, that you're one of the chosen, and that marks you off as, and that's what is your justification, is that you're a member of that group. That's what I believe Paul means when he says the works of the law. Now, but I want to get in, I want to, I want to dive uh, into this passage just a little bit, because here's the Greek underneath the English, because something has, uh, has bothered me over the years about how this is translated. Because you'll see it says the word, but through faith in Jesus Christ, and we have come to believe in Christ Jesus so that we might be justified by faith in Christ. Now, first of all, faith, believe, and faith is all the same word. Faith, faith, faith. But notice the prepositions. In the first line, it says faith in Jesus Christ. But in the Greek, it actually is the faith of Jesus Christ. It's a genitive ending, faith of Jesus Christ. And then it says, and in, and we are in the faith in Jesus Christ. We put our faith in Christ Jesus. And we are justified by the faith of Christ. So that's an interesting observation, right? The faith of Jesus Christ. We believe in Christ Jesus. We trust in Christ Jesus and we are justified by the faith of Christ. So, but through the trust, because the word pistuo can mean trust, faith, believe, all of those words. But through the trust of Jesus Christ, we trusted in Christ Jesus so that we might be justified from or out of the trust of Christ. I, I think there's a significant difference when we translate it this way. And, and here's a visual of that. Because I think that there, there's two different theologies going on here in, in the different prepositions. It, are we justified? Are we made uh, right with God, acquitted of our sins through our faith in Christ or through the faith of Christ? Those are two different things. If you look in the left, um, th some, some theological frameworks talk about how we have to move from death to life cross the chasm of sin based upon my trust, my belief in Jesus. And if I don't get that belief right, I might not make it. And that puts all of the emphasis on my belief and my faith in Christ. But if you translate it the faith of Christ, what justifies us is that it is Christ who trusts God and believes in us that we trust in Christ's faith to save us, that, that Jesus has us. It is the faith of Christ that saves us. Some might say this is splitting semantic hairs. I don't know. I think it's a big deal. You can do with what, what you want. The passage goes on. But if in our effort to be justified in Christ, we ourselves have been found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. But if I build up again the very things that I once tore down, then I demonstrate that I am a transgressor. You see, this is the accusation that Paul's opponents are bringing against him. They are saying that, he, that by the, saying justified in Christ, that Paul has fallen away and that he has become a sinner because this is the gospel that he's preaching. And Paul's like, I don't think so. Because Christ is not a servant of sin. But if I build up again the very things that I once tore down, what's he talking about there? I, I, I think what he's saying is, if, if I preach a gospel where a Gentile has to first be circumcised 
and become a practicing Jew before they can have the justification that comes in Christ alone, then that's that would be him building up the thing that he just tore down, and that would be the transgression in his in his opinion. Because in verse 19 he says, For through the law I died to the law, so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Once again, let's translate this. Here's the actual Greek text, and I'm going to uh, do a literal uh, translation in the English, but with the Greek word order. And let's see if this reads differently. It says, live but no longer I. So I no longer live. Lives but in me, Christ. Christ lives in me. What but now I live in flesh. So what I live now in the flesh is actually in faith I live in. So where it says te tu huia tu theo. It's the, the. And so it's what it's, what's actually saying there is I, I live in the, tra- in the faith of the Son of God. So the life I live is not my faith in Christ, but I live in the faith of Christ, the one who, uh, having loved me and having given himself over for me. So again, my life, my justification is not because of something that I have done because I have trusted correctly in Christ, but my life is in the faith and trustworthiness and faithfulness of Christ who gave himself up for me. I think that's beautiful. And then the final verse, I do not nullify the grace of God. In other words, if you want me to follow what these people are saying and force a Gentile to be circumcised and become Jewish before they can know the grace of God, that would nullify the grace of God. I'm not going to do that. For if justification comes through the law, through becoming first Jewish, then Christ died for nothing. And of course, Paul's argument is that Christ died for everything. Now, this concludes the actual text study. I have one more thing that I'd like to share with you if you want to keep listening. Um, As I've gone through this, this is the way I've kind of put this into what about now? Why why does it matter? Um, So if we read this passage again, we ourselves are Jews by birth. We know that a person is justified. What What if we understood justified or justification as as belonging. So if if we know that a person belongs to God, not by the works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ, and we have come to believe in Christ Jesus so that we might belong by faith in Christ and not by doing the works of the law, because no one will belong by the works of the law. Um, There's two ways to think about this. Maybe you've heard about the difference between a bounded set and a centered set. So a bounded set is when you create uh, the in-group and the out-group based upon people who are exactly the same. And I, I think this may be what uh, Paul's uh, opponents are trying to say. It's like, we have been the people of God, the chosen ones, the children of Abraham, marked by the sign of circumcision, following the dietary laws of Moses. That sets us apart from the nations. And that is that is how you know that you belong to God. We're the in-group and the Gentiles are the out-group. And so this is the bounded set. And what they're saying is, we acknowledge that Jesus is our Messiah, so you need to come into the in-group in order to accept Jesus as the Messiah. And Paul is saying, and these are the works of the law, the circumcision, the rules about food, right? Well, Paul had this encounter with the risen Christ which just shattered open that bounded set for him. And now he sees it differently because he says it's not about your ethnic identity. Now, being a Jew and being circumcised is good and fine. Paul was a Jew and circumcised. That was his ethnicity. But the Gentiles have a completely different ethnic identity. And that doesn't matter because what matters is what you're centered on. 
And so no matter what ethnic group you come from, you can be unified not by becoming homogenous and just like everybody else, but in your own unique ethnic identity, you can become unified by what you're centered on. This is called a centered set. And for Paul, the center is the, the faith of Christ Jesus, who gave himself up for us. Um, so I am crucified with Christ. Right? So this is the centered set. And so for Paul, the God of creation, who has from the beginning of time wanted and created all nations, chose Abraham to be a blessing to all nations, uh, draws us together, not to become all the same, but to become unified in our centered uh, proclamation that Jesus is Lord. All right, there you go. I hope you found these slides helpful. Until next time.